Amen. What a great time to be able to come into worship and think about all that God is doing and the fact that we get to trust in him, to be able to recognize that, to be able to recognize who he is, what he has done, how he is at work, how he is already doing things in our lives and for us and in us. Man, that is a, a great way to be able to have a beginning, to focus on how God really wants to work in your life and how you want to trust him. Thanks for being here, whether you're online or in the room, to be able to celebrate together, to be able to focus on the fact that we are looking to him as the one that we can trust. Now, that is our, that is our goal today. That's our hope today, that everything that we're doing points to him, points to Jesus, saying, saying we can trust him. We is the one who is at work among us. No matter what's around us, we are able to say we are trusting you. And that's what we want to do today, to be able to pour into that, look at his work, to be able to worship in that, to know that he is the one who is trustworthy. That is so important for you. That is so important for your family, for people around you to see that in your life. Because we know there's a lot of stuff that continues to go on around us, right? There are issues that go on in your life. There are struggles in your family or in your finances or in your health or in your workplace. All those things we all deal with. But it comes down to us as Christ's followers to be able to say, we trust in Christ and Christ alone. He is the one that's going to guide us through this. He is the one that's going to give us the direction that we are looking forward to. Today, we're talking about a new series. We're going to be dealing with this here in the month of May. We'll be talking about generosity, what it means to be uh, just really some snapshots of generosity. Today, we're talking about generous generous trust, what it means for us to have trust in Christ, what that generous trust means and how we live that out in everything that we do. Now, most of the time when you think about generosity, you think about, well, it's about finances. Well, we are going to talk about that some during this month, but the truth is we're talking about how we give of everything we have, our treasures, our finances, our time as God has allowed us to do that, our talent, all the things that we have in our life, how are we going to trust God with with all these things? How is God going to work in such a way to build us and to send us into our community? You know, that's what we talk about. What are we about? What is it that we do in our church? And we talk about our mission statement, which really is to see lives transformed. That's the big part of that. It is about seeing life transformation through, the end of that says through Jesus, right? So we want to be able to proclaim Jesus so lives can be changed lives in our neighborhoods, in the generations that are around us, and to the nations, whether we are talking nations across the sea or the nations around us. It is being able to say that is our purpose. That is what God has called us to as a church. That is what God has called us to as individuals, to be able to take the great commission to love people, to let people see Christ in our lives so our trust as we are trusting him begins to grow, begins to come out. Now, if we're going to trust him, if we're going to say, God, we trust you more, we want to be able to move away from all the boundaries that we have in order to have great trust in him. Well, that's sometimes not easy, especially when we might deal with our finances, we might deal with the things of the church, we might deal with who we are and how we give ourselves over to Christ. Today, we're going to be looking at that from a foundational perspective, and I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, we'll read the first few verses of this chapter, to really begin building the foundation of what it means to be a life that is generous, our lifestyle of giving, our lifestyle of saying, Lord, here I am. That really is the key. God hears everything about me. Sometimes we talk about a tenth. We talk about tithing at church. We talk about a stewardship. Uh, we talk about what all those things mean. But really, the New Testament teaches us, as we follow Jesus, that everything about our life belongs to him. We don't just portion it out and say, well, God, you get this part, or God, you get this day of my week, or God, you get this time that I'm doing something. Really, the New Testament teaches that everything about us, when we become a follower of Christ, says, God, our lifestyle is all in. Everything about me is really about you. That's, that really is the bottom line for being a follower of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying that's something that's simple for us. But really, that's what the New Testament's calling us to as Christ followers. If we're going to be a follower of Christ, then we're all in with our lifestyle. Everything about us is about following after Christ. But it's got to start somewhere, right? So we look at this Genesis passage. 
and we say, okay, this is the building of the foundation of understanding of our trust for him. Now, you can follow along, but also let you know that all the notes from today's message are also in our Grace on app. You can download that if you haven't already, and all that information in there. You can put in for more sermon notes and that, however you want to view that as we look at this passage, because really, we're going to be building on trust today, but we're taking it through the entire month of May. For the next five weeks, we'll be talking about generosity and how that generosity and trusting becomes so important, and the foundation of that is here in Genesis chapter 15 as we start reading this chapter. So if you have your Bible, and we're looking at this chapter, here is what he says to us in the first few verses. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. I I wish we could just pause right there just for a moment. Because in those first words from the Lord, He is telling us so much. He is giving us an understanding of who he is. Did you hear that word when he says, fear not, Abram? I am your shield. That means that everything that's going to happen, everything that's coming behind is the fact that he is before us, right? He is, that's what the shield does. It's going out before us. Why can I trust God? Why can I trust God with my finances? Why can I trust God with my life? Why can I trust God with my future? Because he is before us. He is going before us. His shield is there. So he says, fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, always, right? When we hear from the Lord, it's like, yeah, but God, that's what he does, right? But Abram said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, for for your very own son will be your heir. And he brought him aside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Then in verse 6, And Abram, he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteous. The Lord counted to him as righteousness. Now, that verse 6 really is the foundational piece for today. It's the understanding of what belief is. It's the understanding that we, as followers of Christ, from the very beginning, recognize of all the things of who God is. The first thing I want us to see today is that we trust the Father. He is the owner of all things. Nothing we have belongs to us. We may be stewards of that. We may be the one who is helping to facilitate what the Lord has given us. But Abram was reminded, as the Lord told him, to look at all the stars in the heavens, and a reminder again that he is the creator. He is the owner of all things. God is the one who is doing what he is doing And we get to be a part of that. What we have, what is ours, whether it's our treasures or our time or our talent, really belongs to the Lord. He is the owner of all these things. And it's very important for us to begin to recognize that as a foundation to say, if we're going to be generous in giving of ourselves, of our resources, if we're going to be generous as a church in doing the same thing, which we try to be, We try to be generous in helping other organizations and other mission areas around the world, around the country, ways that we're pouring in through the life of our church, not only financially, but sending people and and being able to say, how are we raising up people in order to send people in order to share the gospel? Remember, that's the purpose. The purpose is to see lives transformed, right? It's not about having more or doing more. It's about seeing lives transformed for Jesus, And in so doing that, it builds us, you and me, in a place where we have a greater trust in him. So the Lord tells us that our role is to understand that we are to believe in him, and that's what Abram says. This word that he uses here is not just an intellectual knowledge. It's just not knowing God, right? It's not saying, well, I know that God exists. James tells us that the demons know God exists, but it's a trust. It's saying, I believe God what you are, Lord. I believe what you're telling me. Look at all the promises that are given to us as believers. Yet at the same time, we have such difficulty in believing those promises. Not in believing and we say, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, I believe the Bible says that. But to trust those promises 
and to say that those promises get us through each day, to be able to rely on the promises that he gives us is so very important. So here we see that the Father is the owner of all things. Deuteronomy tells us in Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 14 says, To the Lord your God belong heavens, all the heavens, everything in them. The earth and all of it is in it. All, everything that is in the earth, he says, belongs to me, belongs to the Father. Now, that is, that is an incredible word for us because as followers of Christ, we get to take our understanding of who we are in Christ and know that the Father is the one who owns all things. He is the one who is about all things. Now, to go along to build that, to build that foundation, if we know the Father is the owner of all things, the Bible also says us that we trust the Father is the giver of good gifts. So if he's the owner of all things, he desires to give to his children good gifts. James reminds us that in James chapter 1, when James is talking about who God is and how God's work, James says in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is coming from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. What does James just say? He just took what we find as the foundational point of God, owner of all things, and he said God is about being able to gift us. God wants to give his children good gifts. The third thing that goes along with that is that God wants, we need to understand that as we trust the Father, he wants to bless us. Now, the understanding of blessing sometimes always happens to do, well, God's going to give me things. God's going to give me more of what I want. God's going to give me more money. If I give this, I'll get this. If I do this, it's almost like a bargaining thing. If I give God part of this, God's going to respond by giving me this. Yet, the Bible teaches us that God is going to bless his children. But the blessing that we are going to get from him is because of our obedience, right? Because that we're going to follow after him. We're going to be able to bring our lives under him. Nowhere does the Bible teach us that if we're disobedient, God's going to bless us. It doesn't give us that kind of understanding. It happens to do with our obedience. Just as Abraham, as we know the story of Abraham and the covenant that God gives to Abraham, is the understanding that as Abraham continues to be obedient to the Father, as Abraham continues to do things that God has called, called him out to do, God continues to bless him in so many ways. But then Abraham falls into sin. He does things that are wrong. And when he does, God withholds himself from him. And that's the one thing that we begin to understand as believers. God is, God is not desiring to withhold things from us as children. His desire is to bless us. His desire is to love us. He does love us, right? God is love in the fullness of who he is, the fullness of his mercy, the fullness of his grace, the fullness of his kindness is for us. Now, sometimes we just miss that. We think that God is going to punish us. We think God's whole purpose is to punish us. If I do something wrong, God's going to punish me. It's, it's almost like I, I don't have this covenant with God, and if I do this wrong, God is going to be able to get to the place where the Bible teaches us that if we sin, there are consequences to our sins. But it's not God's desire to punish us. Matter of fact, the Bible would teach just the opposite. It's God's desire to bless us. In Luke chapter 14, if you read that passage from 15 on down through the end of the passage, it's, this, it's God's, it's Jesus' story of the banquet where he has prepared the banquet for his children. But his children don't show up. They make excuses. One's got to go buy a piece of land. One's got to go sell some cattle. One's got to go do this or do that. And it's that whole chapter of making excuses. And, and the owner of the banquet, the one giving the banquet, says, go out and invite people to come in. Go out because I have all these things available. The table is full. The banquet is set. Go out and bring those in. That's the, one of the great things about that story that Jesus gives is the understanding that God desires to give to us. The problem is we hold back ourselves. 
We're not willing to be obedient. Matter of fact, that next part in that Luke passage, he goes right on into what it means to cost, the cost of discipleship, the cost of following after Christ. It is not an easy thing, he tells us in that passage. There is things that have to happen for us to be able to recognize that we in our lives are going to follow after him. There is a, there is a cost to discipleship. There is a cost to following after him. And in the middle of that in the middle of that cost, in the middle of all this going on, what he is guiding us to are people who believe, who trust in him because he is the father. As James already told us, there is no variance. There is no changing. He is the one who is giving to us. Now, as we read this passage, as we go back to Genesis chapter 15, we talk about how trusting the Father because foundationally he is the owner of all things. We trust the Father because he is the giver of good gifts to us. We trust the Father because he wants to bless his children. But we also trust the Father because he rewards those who believe. Look at verse 6 again of chapter 15. And he, Abram, he trusted, he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. You know, one of the things of the greatest reward that we have is not what you have in your home. It's not the car that you drive. It's really not even the people that you're around. The greatest reward that we have from the word of God is salvation. Being able to spend eternity in the presence of God the Father. Being able to spend eternity with Jesus the Son. Being able to spend eternity with the Holy Spirit as in a presence way like we don't even understand even today. That is the reward of righteousness. And it's not our righteousness that he talks about. It's the righteousness of Jesus, what Jesus has done. We've celebrated today as we've talked about the very fact that he died on the cross. The very fact that his body was broken for us. He went to the cross in order there had to be a payment for sin. There had to be a payment for sin because we know that the wages of death, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Where does that gift come from? It came from one who died on the cross, his body broken for us. It came from one whose covenant, the new covenant of life that he told us about, that he shared with his disciples and has been passed down to us. This new covenant that comes because of his blood being spilt for us. The understanding of the Passover that had happened during that time that Jesus celebrated the first Lord's Supper. The understanding of of blood covering the doorpost. The understanding of, of blood covering us because something had to pay for our sin. And he did that on the cross. But the end result is not the cross, right? The end result of his righteousness is the fact that Jesus is alive, that he rose from the dead, that he no longer is in the tomb, that he no longer has a, has a rock old, rolled over the tomb and he's buried somewhere. It's just the opposite. He is alive. He is, he is working among us. He went back to heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father to intercede for you and me. That's why we can trust. Man, should it, should it not surprise us that when we go through life and we struggle with things, we like, how do we trust God? How do we trust God? How do we trust God? And he tells us he's at the right hand of the Father interceding for you when you have things going on in your life. Man, that is incredible news for us. He tells us that because of the resurrection, the sin and death have been broken and we have life. That's what we find in Genesis 15 as the foundational point of the covenant with God. A foundational point that says that God, God is about all of it. God owns everything. God desires to, to bless Abram, and he is about doing that. And it says there, it gives us, it gives us so much because he said he believed the Lord. And so the question becomes: do you trust the Lord? Do you believe what he has told you in the promises? Do you recognize that his reward is eternal life? And do you have eternal life? Have you come to that place where you are saying, Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you with my salvation. I'm trusting you with my life. I'm trusting you to forgive my sins. I'm trusting you to cleanse me from unrighteousness. Lord, I am trusting you. I'm trusting you to take me into the morrow because we do not know what the future holds. But, We know that as we trust him and his promises, he is about leading us and guiding us and showing us and directing us and building us and giving you 
the trust that you need. And so he calls us to that. He says, if we're going to be generous, if we'll be generous in our giving, not just our financial resources, but in that too, very important. But if we're generous in our giving of ourselves, generous in being obedient to what he has called us to, then the Lord says, the Lord says to us, as he says here in this passage, verse six, and he counted it to him as righteousness. The Lord wants to do so much in your life. He wants you to walk out of this place with the understanding that your life has victory in him. Now, if you walk out of this place and you're not a follower of Christ, and you're missing the victory. You're missing the opportunity to say, I'm walking in a new spirit. I'm walking with the Holy Spirit in me, guiding me, and that's how I can trust. You're missing that opportunity of walking with him. But if you walk out of here saying, man, I'm a follower of Christ, I desire to be obedient, I understand that I'm trusting in him, it is, a, it is an incredible, generous kind of trust that I can have in the Lord. It's a new day for you. It's a new opportunity to say, God, with you, I can face tomorrow. With you, I know because you are worthy and it is about Jesus and you are worthy and everything about you is in my life. And that's what Abraham speaks about. That's what he tries to give to us, that understanding that as we trust and Abram believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Will you believe the Lord today? Will you believe the Lord for your salvation? If you are a follower of Christ, will you believe the Lord for his promises? Will you believe the Lord as you go out in this place and say, his best is for you and what he has for you is the desire to follow after him? Will you go out of this place saying, I believe him and I want to be obedient like never before with everything I have, with my treasures, with my time, with how he's gifted me, with the opportunity to Share the good news of Jesus with a neighbor, with a person in another generation, maybe a person from another nation, that their life can be transformed through Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you right now, we are so thankful for your love to us. We are so thankful that you died on the cross and rose from the dead that we might have life. And Lord, if we can trust that, can't we trust everything? If we can trust you for our salvation, cannot we trust you in our everyday problems and everyday struggles? Lord, I believe we can. Help us as we desire to trust you more. In his name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and sing. If you'd love to talk about what it means to follow Christ or have a prayer need, I'd love to meet you and talk about that. But we're gonna sing about who he is and how he wants to work in your life and you respond to him as we sing.